Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the table with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple's been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Please join me in a prayer. As we gather in our Father's house today, may we pause to reflect on the comfort its presence brings to us. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to gather, worship, and praise you. We give thanks for Reverend Bob Brookman as he shares his message with us this morning. May your spirit guide him in the words he offers that we may find meaning and purpose in them. Be with Reverend Brookman this week and always as he helps to spread your light in the world. We pray that your caring hands continue to work in the life of Pastor Terry as she takes her sabbatical to refresh and renew her spirit. May you continue to grace her with healing for her body, inspiration for her spirit, and joy for her life. Be with the church body of Epworth as we seek discernment for our future. Help us find ways to reinvigorate our congregation toward the mission you would have us take on. For all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the first time I think somebody has said a prayer for me. Don't get me wrong, I've had people pray for me, but they spelled it P-R-E-Y. Hey, I'm open to that, I mean, what the heck? If you all trust me, and if you don't, I don't care, would you please stand a minute, if you can. Well, hug one another, for God's sake. <laughs> Jeez, crack. <laughs> if you got something contagious, raise your hand. Okay, you can sit down. I always figure a happy group makes a happy camp and they don't come after the pastor. I want to tell you a couple of things about me first. One, my name is Robert Henry Brookman. I've been married. I'm divorced. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I have a female companion living with me now. Um, we share the house together. We share the bedroom. We don't share the same bed. She sleeps in her bed. I sleep in my bed. And we don't come together. And. Her name is Sheila. She's also a chocolate Labrador retriever. <laughs> now the reason I tell you this is because I talk about something you all suffer from. I call it boxes. We make boxes. 
rather quickly. As you did when I gave you my name, there was a box being formed with my name on it. The fact that I was been married, there was there. Divorced, you ever put it there? He's got a female companion. <laughs> Shares the same bedroom. <laughs> Different beds. Oh, that's a little bit better. And when I said it was a dog, your box got happier. <laughs> we all have boxes. The scripture reading this morning, we've boxed it. If you remember, Jesus went to the temple. He made a whip out of cords, chased all the animals, the birds, the cows, out of the temple, chased the money changers out, and turned over the tables with the money on it. Then when was asked, he said he had replaced the temple in three days. And he was talking about his death and resurrection. And we talk about that. You've heard that, I'm sure, probably once every three years or something like that if they follow the lectionary. And you've heard the Easter story every year. Well, I'm not going to tell you the Easter story. I'm going to talk to you about the temple. If you remember, the scripture says his disciples remembered that his zeal for the temple would be tremendous. And so they kind of put it aside in their own box. But he told the people, you are making a marketplace out of my father's house. Well, you know what? Back then, it was a marketplace. Because the money you have in your pocket or in your purse Nowadays, you can put it in the collection plate, but guess what? Back then, you couldn't. It had an image of a person. Whether it's a dollar bill, a hundred dollar bill, whether it's 20 cents or a quarter or 50 cents, there's an image of a person on it, and that's a no-no. You had to change your money. Because if you remember, when Jesus was asked about who do we owe, Caesar or God, he said, show me a coin. And he showed him a coin that they used for everyday business. And Caesar's image was on it. And he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. So the thing was, you couldn't use your money there. You had to get it changed. And not only that, it's like if you wanted to make a sacrifice because somebody was ill in the family or you wanted something to happen, you needed to have an animal because you could no longer sacrifice your child. Remember Abraham and Isaac? You had to use a lamb, a bird, a cow, whatever. And so there were people there selling him. But he said, you're making my father's house a marketplace. Well, gee whiz, it was a marketplace. Requirement was it had to be a marketplace in a sense. So why was he upset? Well, think about it. Most of you probably live in a house or an apartment 
that's your place that you live, right? You can raise your head up and down or sideways, I don't care, whichever. We all know what a house is, right? Do you know what a home is? It's not a house. A home is different. Do you know what a home is? Home is where love is. A house is a house. When there's love, it's a home. So what I'm talking about is like, is this place a house of God? Yes. No. There's a difference. Yes, it is, but no, it's not. I'll explain in a minute. Because it's a physical thing, for sure. And all the physical things of the world are going to be gone. I don't care what it is. If you ever watch those history on TV talking about vanished civilizations, guess what? When they were alive, they were not vanished civilization. It was all the ones before them. So even the pyramids of Egypt, they're going to be gone someday, just like this building. So buildings can't be, in a sense, the house, the home of God. And if you go to Easter sunrise service and you have it outside because the weather's good and you know, you're really enjoying the sunrise and everything, that's not a house of God. That's not a home of God. Because it's physical. Whether like the old Germans used to worship the evergreen tree and the other people through the ages have worshipped places like Stonehenge. It's not where God is. So where is God? Have you ever thought about that? God's everywhere. Oh, I knew that. We all knew that. Sure, but did you know the two places God never is? You don't? Oh, come on. You all know God's never at those two places. One is the bathroom. He's never there. I mean, either that or my dog has learned how to laugh when I take a shower. The thing is, we never think about him being in the bathroom, and we never think about him being in the bedroom when we're making love. God's not there. No. God's somewhere else. But God's everywhere. God's present. His spirituality is everywhere. It's in everything. Just as you've put part of yourself in your job, in what you've created, in your children, I don't care what, you put part of yourself in a person, a thing, but you can't ever find it. But you know it's there. Well, God does the same thing in all he has created. He's everywhere. He's in the rocks, in the trees, in you, and in your neighbor. The only thing that separates us, you know what that is? Look in the mirror. It's you. It's me. We separate. We make boxes. We decide, we judge what is right, what is wrong. God doesn't. God is everywhere, God's home, God's house, God's presence, God's unconditional love is everywhere. But it isn't. That doesn't sound right. If it is, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. Well, 
tell you the truth, life is a paradox, isn't it? As we get older, we wish we were younger. And if you remember when we were younger, we wish we were older. We aren't always satisfied. We're always struggling. And the problem is, because God is everywhere, yes. Whether here with you, outside with the people driving, over in Ukraine where people are killing one another, you name it, God's everywhere. But you know what? God's always with us, but we're not always with God, are we? It's not about God that's the problem. The problem is us, each and every one of us. Oh, we think about God, especially when we know someone who's sick or in trouble or whether we want something from God, we'll pray to God. He's up there somewhere. But we're not with him the rest of the time. We're here for an hour or so. We're with God. But then you get on the road and somebody cuts you off. I'm not going to say what I say. God is with us all all the time, always. We are not with him. There's the problem. God's love, his unconditional love is with us, which means he loves us no matter what. What we say, what we do, he still loves us. We can't earn his love. We can't finagle him out of it. The old so-and-so just loves us. We just don't seem to love in return. So the thing is, it's the focusing. It's whether we focus on God, his presence, his reality with us, within this floor, within this, this wall, within the pews you're sitting on. God is present. But we don't focus on that. We've got our own little box labeled God. Don't we? We pull it out when we need it. We pull it out when we want it, and we put it back because we get busy with, how did Jesus put it? The marketplace. We get busy with things to do, people to see, jobs, you name it. We get busy with so many things. Thank goodness we can see God once a week or talk with him when we want to. We need to focus on the presence and reality of God's love for us. Always, as much as we can. You're lucky if you make it 10 seconds a day, to tell you the truth. And the thing is, part of it is being responsible. If you remember what Jesus said, why have you made my father's house a marketplace? God didn't do it. God still doesn't do it. We do it. We make our lives busy. We make our relationship with God according to us. We are responsible for all of God's creation. It says so in, a, in the beginning of the Bible, in Exodus. God made man responsible by naming them of all that God creates. 
and we've kind of fallen short on that one, haven't we? We've also fallen short on the fact that God makes us responsible for one person and one person only. Us. You. Me. The worst enemy we will ever have is that one we see in the morning, every morning when we look in the mirror. Because we decide not to be with God. We decide what God is and isn't. We decide where God is and where he ain't. It's our choice. Your choice, my choice, all our choices. I hope you make the right decision. His love is really tremendous. It's really great. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we thank you for your presence with us always and your love that is so wonderful. We ask that we might truly, truly decide to be with you as much as possible, to know your love, to know your presence, to see you within the people around us, to see you in the things that we've taken for granted, to really hear your words of love so that we might truly, truly be with you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. If you turn to the celebration of Holy Communion,